Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the second Sunday of Advent. I was talking with 
one of the ladies this morning who said this is very advantageous. <laughs> Sorry. Well, why don't we stand and begin our service with prayer? Oh God, as we search for your blessings, let us see you in all areas of our lives. May our eyes be opened to your presence. Forgive us for our spiritual blindness. May we not only seek you here in this time of worship, but let us see Jesus in our homes and in our community. We thank you, Father, for revealing Jesus on all pages of the Bible. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. I guess with the living word, I'm sorry, the Lutheran Bible, at, I get it, yeah, the LBW on number 30. Come down long, expect the Jesus. in silence. Most merciful God, we confess that we are not to be sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may be delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you. And for this, his sake, God forgives you you all your sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray together. O come, O come, Emmanuel, 
and ransom captive sinners here on earth, that mourn in lowly exile here until your Son, Jesus Christ, appears. And when Jesus does appear, may we, along with Mary, find favor in your eyes. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Advent calls us to prepare our hearts for the coming of Christ. All around us, people are preparing for parties, for dinners, presents, yet these activities often detract us from what is really important of today's preparation. But on the other hand, behind these distractions, you might hear the echo of the voice crying in the wilderness of materialism. Prepare for what is really important. 
prepare you the way of the Lord. Rather than get lost in this wilderness of distractions, may the music and the candles make us attentive to the voice that is even now calling us to prepare. We will listen for the word in the words of Scripture. This reading is from the book of Malachi, the third chapter. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord, as in the days of old and as in former years. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This reading is from the book of Luke, the first chapter, to be read responsibly. Blessed be the Lord of God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. And has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. The oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear. In holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. To give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high. To give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Sunday of Advent, we light the second candle as an act of preparation, and we call it peace. Please stand.
Today's scripture reading is from Genesis chapter 22. <clears throat> Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his thorns, horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. The word of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, o Christ. Let us repeat the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Well, as we prepare for the birth of our Lord Jesus, last Sunday we heard of Mary's visit to Elizabeth. We read her prose, which we, are, which we call today the Magnificat. And then we see that Mary went home after visiting with Elizabeth for three months. But I want to do something different today as most of the readings comes to us from, it's almost Easter stories. I want to change that up. I want to go back and look at the perspective of the Old Testament. I remember many, many times having discussions way out of my depth. <laughs> about the New Testament versus the Old Testament. And I can't recall how many times I've heard, well, we don't need the Old Testament, we have the new one. Oh, yeah? Okay. Well, you know, when I was about this high, I bought into that for about five minutes. Because it didn't make sense. Because when you think about it, Jesus quotes the Old Testament. So how can we just toss it away? So, what I wanted to do today is give you some food for thought. Kind of a, I don't know, philosophical as it were. A little idea of, gee, what does this really mean in the world that we live in, dealing with the Word of God? So, I thought I'd go through today an example of where we see Jesus the story of Jesus in the Old Testament. Now we all know that Isaiah talks about Jesus and predicts his coming. But let's talk about Jesus and remember that it is an eternal story. It's not just one testament or the other. His story is eternal. Notice that it did not begin in the manger in Bethlehem. His birth, yes. 
But his beginning was always. It was he, he was part of the essence of God. I mean, let's face it, he is God. It's a story that has been included in the purpose of God ever since he said, let there be light. It's a story which has that inclusive element. A story that's ever expanding to God, touching the lives of all people who will submit to him. The Christmas story is not written in the pretty decorations that we place around our homes. It's not written as we exchange gifts. The Christmas story is written in our acceptance of Jesus as the Savior and Lord of our lives. So let's jump back into the Old Testament. Let's see if we can see Jesus there. Kind of a shock when you're saying, okay, he hasn't been born yet. How can we talk about him? But we can. Dr. Robert Lee used to share a story about a famous songwriter who loved the Lord very much. The composer wrote a song with a beautiful romantic tune and a wonderful message about Jesus. Now, he was offered a large sum of money by a secular publishing company if he would just change the lyrics. Well, it seems rather strange when you consider that the lyrics are an integral part of the song. But here he was asked to change one word. The publishing company asked him to change the word Jesus to love. Okay. But the composer replied, if you leave out Jesus, you've left out everything. How true. How true. Well, then there was the professing Christian who, after a powerful experience with God, said to his pastor, I had been listening to you preach for many years, but had not been hearing you. I know you had been preaching the word of God and Jesus, and I know I had been, you, know, you had been telling me what I needed to hear, but I wasn't hearing it. And he continued, since I committed my life to Jesus, I now hear what you're saying. It's kind of like, I get it. Or I could add a V8, one or the other. Okay? But you understand where he's coming from. Now that I've accepted Jesus Christ into my life, I hear what you're saying. Because now you're not talking to my head, you're talking to my heart. Big difference. People read the Bible, unfortunately, but they fail to see Jesus. Not unfortunately, they read it. It's unfortunate they fail to see Jesus on the pages that they're reading. They go to church and do not come to face to face with Christ. I love the story of a boy in Sunday school. He identified the Sunday school teacher was saying, okay, we have this entity. It has a bushy tail, climbs trees, and likes to eat nuts. What is it? The little boy says, well, I know it's a squirrel, but we're in Sunday, we're in Sunday school, so it's got to be Jesus. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, people are in the environment of Christian experience, but they don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. They know about him, but they don't really know him personally. Did you ever think that in reading Genesis, you could see Jesus almost every page? 
I remember one of the first things we talked about in seminary, which was kind of fun. He says, okay, remember, he was there all the time because God said, let us make man in our image. Jesus is there. The problem with the Jews in the first century was that they could not identify the Messiah because they had never seen him in the Bible. Reading through Genesis, we see Jesus in many things. He, Genesis did not speak of Jesus' birth, this we know, but it does demonstrate his existence. Remember when God said, let us make man in our image. The first mention of how God is more than one. It's the first mention of the Trinity. Two experiences in the life of Isaac illustrates God's plan in Jesus. They show us that God has always had a plan to seek and save the lost. We have our sacrificing Savior, and we have the seeking Savior. God made a covenant with Abraham. We've all heard this story, telling him that all nations of the earth would be blessed through his descendants. However, Abraham didn't have any yet. So he didn't understand, but he took the matters into his own hands, you might say, since he did not, since he did not see any way the promise could happen or could be fulfilled, he decided that he's going to give God a hand. At the urging of Sarah, he had a son with a handmaiden, Hagar. But he was not the son of promise. He was not the son that God had told Abraham he was going to have. God spoke when Abraham was 99 years old and Sarah was 90. And he said, I am going to give you a son. Well, I know I laughed too when I read it. I kind of like Sarah. I say what? But the miracle happened. He had a son and he named him Isaac. Later, God said, Abraham, you must be willing to sacrifice your son. So Abraham took Isaac to Mount Moriah. This simple childlike obedience of Abraham is reflected in the quiet demeanor of Isaac, who was bearing the wood for the burnt offering. This would be the type of Jesus bearing his cross inquiring for the lamb with lamb-like innocence and patience. If Abraham's surrender of Isaac was a shadow of the sacrificing love of the eternal father and sparing not only his only son, and the bound Isaac, typical of the church's condemnation condition, or condemned, I'm sorry, before the sacrifice of Christ on Calvary, And the substituted ram was emblematic of him who, though he knew no sin, was made sin for all of us. The deliverance of Isaac was symbolic both of the resurrection life of Christ and of the new life of his redeemed people. Well, that brings us to sin. Notice that Isaac carried the load of the sacrifice. Not only was he going to be sacrificed, or so we thought, but he gets to carry everything too. And remember, all humankind is under the weight of sin, like Isaac was under the weight of the wood. We all carry our own weight. 
Now, if we read the passage in light of our scholastic friends or trends, we might judge God to be unjust in asking Abraham to sacrifice his one and only son. Again, when I was young, and I read stories like this, I was thinking, man, God is kind of cruel. Abraham wakes 99 years to have a kid. And here, God wants him to burn him at the stake. I don't get it. I didn't get it. But then I finally got it. I finally understood now, when we take a look at this from God's perspective, it's quite different. Isaac, like all of us, deserved to die. Why? Well, he was a sinner. We all are. And we know that the wages of sin, and we're told this in the Bible, is death. Isaac, on his way to his own sacrifice, is symbolic of the needs of humankind. He was under the load of sin, a sinner with questions and no answers, a sinner who sin had no forgiveness. Well, a person with no hope, even though the promise of God rested on his whole life, makes you think. Well, Abraham and Isaac went to the place that God had designated, and Abraham built an altar. He tied his son and was ready to sacrifice him when God said, Lay not to thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything to him. I think in the Navy they call it belay that order. I'm not a I was army, it was as you were. But God, the angel, said, Wait a minute. We see Isaac as a symbol of sinful humankind under the load of sin and without hope. But then God spoke. But notice that when God spoke, we don't see Isaac. Instead, we see the provision of God. That God supplied a ram, his horns caught in a bush. Now we have a sacrifice in place of Isaac. Hmm. In place of Isaac. God was ready to take the load of sin off his shoulders and out of the heart of Isaac. And the ram was sacrificed instead. Abraham's faith was demonstrated, as we see, by willing to sacrifice his son. But the important thing is that a sufficient substitute has appeared by the grace of God. Well, this story reminds us, of course, of Jesus. We are carrying the burden of our guilt, not supposed guilt, not assumed guilt, but real guilt. We deserve the penalty of hell, but by the grace of God, he sent us a lamb. The lamb of Jesus, humbly born in Bethlehem's manger. Sadly, yet victoriously living among his own people, who rejected him and terribly yet gloriously dying on Calvary's cross. Why? For our sins. Now picture Abraham and Isaac coming down from Mount Moriah. Isaac is not carrying the load any longer. The sacrifice has been made. Isaac is no longer asking, where is the lamb? The lamb was provided. Isaac had been saved. Christ has come. The sacrifice was made. The price had been paid on the cross of Calvary. 
And the resurrection has provided salvation for all who accept him. We are free from the guilt of sin because of the lamb that God provided. We don't have to say, God will provide. He has provided. The universe could not purchase that pacification. No effort could make us worthy of it. Yet it is freely offered to us today. And note what the gift includes. It included the help of the Holy Spirit. This Holy Spirit's wisdom, help in trials, Peace and the needs of this life. Bring all thy sins, thy wants, thy hindrances to the mercy seat, we read in Hebrews. The Lord will see, will look upon thy need, and ere thy prayer is offered, he has provided what that need requires. Now remember, I said that we have two experiences in the life of Isaac to illustrate God's plan in Jesus. Another story is to remind us about the seeking Savior. Abraham had left his relatives in Haran and gone to Canaan. Isaac needs a wife. The Canaanite women were not right for Isaac because the people worshipped idols. Isaac as the son of promise, would be an ancestor of Jesus. So here's something taking place in the Old Testament, in the time of Isaac, which leads to Jesus. The right wife had to be found. Well, Abraham sent a servant, Eliezer, back to Haran to find his bride for Isaac. Eliezer went to the home of Laban, or Laban, the kinsman of Abraham and Sarah, where he obtained Laban's permission to take Rebekah to be Isaac's wife. Now, Rebekah's mother did not want her daughter to leave, but finally the moment came when Rebekah was asked, will you go and be the bride of Isaac? She simply said, I will go. I will go. Well, a glorious meeting took place between Rebekah and Isaac. As and, uh, from scripture, and Isaac went out to meditate in the field at eventide, which is the evening, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off her camel and dismounted. This is all in Genesis 24, which we didn't read. Okay, but why would God put this beautiful love story in the Bible? My first question to that is, why not? Because God is again telling us about Jesus. He is telling us about the son of promise, Isaac, in search of a bride. Jesus also came in search of a bride Jesus is the Son of God, and his bride is the church. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> As Abraham sent out Eliezer, God sends out the Holy Spirit in search of the bride of Christ. What did Eliezer do? Well, he went to Haran and told Rebekah about Isaac. Similarly, Christ has come, and the Holy Spirit of God moves around the world to tell people about Christ just like Haran did about Rebecca. I should say telling Rebecca. Jesus gathers the church, the bride of Christ, and God has always had a plan. The plan is Jesus. I started with that. For Jesus, God, has a plan. Jesus is his plan. If you leave out Jesus, you have left out everything, says our composer. Jesus is the essence of God's grace. Jesus is the Savior who not only saved Isaac from death, but also from guilt and from hell. He saves us from death, guilt, and hell. 
Well, Jesus is the one who sends forth his Holy Spirit in search of his bride. <coughs> <coughs> oh, that tickle. <coughs> well, that of itself is a beautiful truth. Not only has God provided salvation, but he searches the earth for the souls of men and women, boys and girls, who will give themselves to him and will say, as Rebecca said, I will go. And one of my favorite hymns, Here I am, Lord. Amen. Amen. the wisdom to use them wisely to support the church, our communities, and most important, to honor you in all that you give us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please be seated. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took the bread, broke it, and said, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the supper, he gave thanks and took the wine and said, Take and drink. This is the new covenant in my blood. As often as we drink of this, 
do so in the remembrance of me. That's a little better. The table is set. Come and eat.
Remember to share the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. We do so in remembrance of his return. Amen. Amen. Okay, we have prayers today. I talked with uh, Barbara Gerstad the other day. And Gary's doing better. He's still in pain, but I guess it's from the incision. From the, I mean, what did he do? Cut his throat, go in the back. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think he went through here to replace three vertebrae in his, in his neck, or not vertebrae, discs. So he's still in pain, but he's, he's home and resting, and Barbara's taking care of him. Thank God for good surgeons. They said they did an x-ray, and it looks like a work of art. So, score. Yeah. Uh, Darlene Lupert, as you know, has been out for a little bit, but she thanks you for her prayers and that her progress is going well. Or is that? Uh, 
Slowly. Slowly. She's slowly healing. But the good news is she's healed. Outstanding. Oh boy. We got some young people. Willow has a birthday yesterday. She's eight. Where's Willow? Say how old she is. We'll be coming. She's huh? Yeah, she's she's twenty, right? She, she's twenty, right? still for the, uh, she's off the monitor, which is good, and she goes in every three, every three weeks for them to check the, I want to call it a fibrillation, but it's some kind of a heart flutter, where it went from normal pace to 400. So anyway, but she's doing it well. Okay, well, on that note, let's pray. Father, today, as every day, we give you thanks, and we praise your wonderful and glorious name, and we also know that you created us, and we thank you for that, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. All the grace that you give us, we thank you. It's sufficient for those who are persecuted. We have constantly, we do constantly hear on the news how Christians are being sought, not only persecuted, but murdered. We ask that you hold them close because they know that they are yours. They know that you hold them close. They know of your love. And we thank you, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. We thank you for the opportunity to meet here as your congregation, as your group of servants who love you and worship you on today as we do every day, specifically today on this Advent Sunday. We remember why we are here. We remember who we are. More important, we know whose we are. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Father, we thank you for the many things we have. We like to remember your generosity and the constancy and, and to do your will. We ask you that you save us from violence and the discord of the world, the confusion of our community, and all of the evil courses that seem to take action here. We know that we can give it to you because you control everything. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Father, as we continue to have this violence and this strife, we give you thanks and ask for your care and concern for our military. They are in the front lines. So are our first responders, our police, our fire, our doctors, our nurses, we thank you for them. We also thank you for those who are standing at the grocery stores, taking care of those who are in need. Nobody ever says thank you to them. But we ask that you bless them, hold them close, because they too are serving you by serving us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Help us, Father, to support and encourage families of those who are on the front lines. We ask that you keep them in peace, hold their hearts so that they understand and encourage not only themselves, but well, each other and their loved ones, but the community around them. Lord, we ask this in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And Father, we lift to you the many who suffer we continue to lift to you, Darlene, 
and ask for her continued healing. We lift you, Gary, as he too is still struggling with pain, but still seeks your loving hands, which he has accepted and loves and knows. We thank you, Father, for the kindness and the competence and the patience of those around us who serve you. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Well, into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, as we continue our prayers, we lift to you the Apostles' Creed. Our Father, Father, I'm sorry, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I'm allowed at least five mistakes a service. I think that was 15. <laughs> well, I have several announcements today. First of all, after the service, there's a special board meeting. And we will be meeting in the conference room. Okay, and that's right after church. Um, there are, there's no men's breakfast this month. So it's been reported. We'll take it up again in January. Okay. The ladies' breakfast yesterday, they had way too much fun. <laughs> they were singing, and I mean, really? <laughs> I was in my office, because I took Peggy, as she doesn't drive. Well, I, I was sitting in my office, and I'm singing right along with them. They got near me. So, anyway, it was fun. Uh, I was also informed, what was I, that was no men's breakfast. Okay. Um, time and... Talent forms, please get those in. I think we have most of, if not all. If you still have yours out there, please get that done so the budgeting people and the stewardship and all that can be taken care of. Special gift from my wife and I on the 12th, that's next Sunday, we're doing the coffee. <laughs> she and I are always serving coffee and cupcakes. So I just thought I would share that. And the flowers today are given to, by uh, Jeff and Sarah on celebration of Willa and Sarah's, Sarah's birthdays, which we celebrated a minute ago, and the birth, of course, of Elena, the new arrival. <laughs> we had another announcement this morning, too. Where did you are? Looking everywhere, but where you are. Doug <laughs> Hey, I'm Mike Fenimore, and uh, stewardship chairman. This last week, Lydia, Roji, and I went to work on all the time and talent sheets that have been turned in. And we've collected all those, got all the information together, and Cecilia has all that. But what we notice is we don't have all the time and talent sheets. I have two on my desk. Okay. We're kind of taking a post-COVID look at this. We've been locked up for two years. It's time to go back to work, okay? So if you haven't turned in a time and talent sheet, please do turn it into the office. We'll get you on the list under the ministries you want to work in. And to that point of this, if you sign up for a ministry and you don't get called, call them and tell them you want to go to work, okay? It's time we do that. You know, we've had enough. Might you. <laughs> <laughs> the other one is Larry and crew do a great job of, of managing us financially, right? But they need all of your commitment information so that they can move forward and know what to plan or how to plan. You know? Arm them with the information of your intention. We really, really need that. Third, 
we all gave, or, or most of us gave intentions last year, what we're going to do, it's coming toward the end of the year, we need to fulfill those. Or if you're going to give extra or whatever, do that now as they close, get ready to close the year. Right, Larry? Oh. Yes. We are in need. Charlene got to me just before the service and said, remind the congregation. They've had to dip into reserves to keep us going. That's probably not a surprise to anybody given the way we've had to live for the last two years, but they've done it. They're into reserves now. They want you to know it. They don't want to be there. Um, I'd say let's get back to work as the leaders we all are and let's get us out of that situation. So we need your time and talent sheets. We need your tithe intention sheets. Turn them into the office and we'll get all that stuff recorded. And let's finish up this year as a success, if you will. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. As you all know, any organization needs funding. And we are no different. I guess that, that's all the announcements. Yes, sir. Is there going to be a table talk next week? Table talk, yeah, next week. I thought I did. I guess it would be late to announce it next week. But yeah, there will be a table. It's a congregational, right after services, we got some stuff to share. Thank you, Ron. Okay? Good stuff, right? Good stuff. Okay, and anything else I missed? I'd just like to follow up what Mike said. Uh, we uh, we have uh, for the last 11 months we have been uh, uh, 10 of those months we have been behind receipts versus expenses. And I looked at uh, October the budget and if if it as of October. We, in the new budget that we are getting ready to present, we would be $73,000 minus at the end of the year. So, we need help. Ouch. Okay. All right, that being said, let us rise for the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he place his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.